One iconic moment from this confrontation stands out. Ludendorff's audacious march straight into the firing line of the professional army. The fact that not a single soldier dared shoot at their old commander spoke volumes about the complex interplay of respect, authority, and shifting loyalties within the German military ranks. The aftermath of the putsch was significant. Hitler and several of his comrades were arrested and subsequently sentenced. Though Hitler's sentence was five years, he served just 13 months in prison. It was during this period of incarceration, away from the fervor of rallies and the heat of street confrontations, that Hitler penned Mein Kampf. The book, while outlining his broader ideological views, is also a reflection of the times, of the challenges faced by post-World War I Germany, of the deep divisions and debates within the nation, and of Hitler's own personal journey, from the streets of Munich to the cold confines of a Bavarian prison. Mein Kampf stands as a testament to Adolf Hitler's complex psyche, his ambitions for Germany, and the intricacies of his ideology. Delving into its pages, one is immediately confronted with a range of themes that shed light on the author's mindset and the broader socio-political context of his era. At the heart of Mein Kampf is Hitler's vision for Germany, a nation united not just by territorial boundaries, but by the bonds of race. He aspired to mold a racially pure nation, one devoid of elements he considered alien or impure. This obsession with racial purity, a recurring motif throughout the book, underscores the dangerous allure of ideologies based on exclusion and supremacy. The narrative style of Mein Kampf is anything but linear. Rambling and often disjointed, the book oscillates between Hitler's personal grievances, his reinterpretations of historical events, and his bold ideological assertions. This scattered approach reflects Hitler's thought process, a fusion of personal experiences and broader historical and political analyses. The text is also peppered with moments of fervent rhetoric, aiming to incite passion and allegiance among its readers. One of Hitler's more prominent grievances, woven into the fabric of Mein Kampf, is his disdain for what he termed the Jewish press. He believed that the media, under Jewish influence, played a significant role in manipulating public opinion against his cause and the broader objectives of National Socialism. This belief is indicative of the deeply ingrained anti-Semitic views that would have catastrophic consequences in the years to follow. While Mein Kampf is broad in its scope, Hitler had a specific audience in mind those devout to the movement of National Socialism. He intended the book to serve as a guide, a manifesto of sorts, for those seeking a deeper understanding of its underlying principles and aims. Hitler's focus on oratory, as opposed to the written word, is poignantly captured in his own reflection. I know that fewer people are won over by the written word than by the spoken word and that every great movement on this earth owes its growth to great speakers and not to great writers. This quote underscores his belief in the power of speech as a tool for mass mobilization and the realization of his vision. Through the turbulent waters of Mein Kampf, one gains not only an insight into Hitler's mindset but also a broader understanding of the socio-political milieu of the time, a period marked by unrest, intense nationalism, and the desperate search for direction in a post-war Germany. Translating a work as historically charged and controversial as Mein Kampf presents a formidable challenge. The task not only demands linguistic precision but also requires an understanding of the ideological, cultural, and personal nuances that underpin the text. James Murphy, in his English rendition of Hitler's Manifesto, grappled with these complexities, striving to render an accurate and insightful version for an English-speaking audience. Translating Hitler's intricate rhetoric is no simple feat. His verbose style, laden with German idiomatic expressions, historical references, and impassioned oratory, demands meticulous attention to detail. Beyond mere linguistic accuracy, a translator must also navigate the intricate maze of Hitler's mindset, 
attempting to capture the essence of his beliefs and the fervor with which he presents them. Murphy's translation is often lauded for its endeavor to maintain the nuances of the original German text, a testament to his commitment to providing readers with an authentic experience of Hitler's writings. Murphy, in his translator's notes and subsequent reflections, emphasizes viewing Mein Kampf as a historical document, a snapshot of a specific moment in Germany's turbulent history. He underscores the notion that the text bears the unmistakable imprint of its time, rooted in the post-World War I socio-political landscape and the personal experiences of its author. This perspective is critical when attempting to understand the motivations behind Hitler's narrative and the resonance it found among many Germans. This historical anchoring is poignantly encapsulated in Murphy's words. But, as those things belong to the limbo of a dead past that nobody wishes to have remembered now, it is often asked, why doesn't Hitler revise Mein Kampf? This reflection prompts readers to grapple with the evolving nature of narratives and the challenges inherent in revising a text so deeply embedded in its historical context. Would a revision strip the book of its historical essence? Murphy seems to suggest that it might, implying that Mein Kampf, for all its controversies, offers invaluable insights into a crucial era and should be approached with a critical, informed perspective. In the realm of translation, every rendition is, to some extent, an interpretation. Through Murphy's work, English readers gain not only access to Hitler's words but also a glimpse into the translator's own understanding and framing of the text, a layered experience that adds depth and nuance to the reading of Mein Kampf. The term, Reich, holds profound historical, cultural, and ideological significance within German consciousness, a fact keenly manipulated and embraced by Adolf Hitler in his writings and speeches. To understand Hitler's ambitions for Germany, one must first recognize the historical precedence and weight of the Reich in the Germanic psyche and the ways Hitler envisioned its manifestation in his ideal world order. Historically, Germanic territories witnessed the formation and dissolution of various Reichs or empires. From the Holy Roman Empire, often referred to as the First Reich, to the German Empire or the Second Reich, under the Hohenzollern dynasty, the idea of a unified Germanic Empire has been an enduring dream for German nationalists. Hitler's vision for the Third Reich aimed to encompass all German-speaking peoples and territories, marking the culmination of these historical aspirations. Central to this vision was the East Mark, an area roughly corresponding to present-day Austria. Hitler, an Austrian by birth, regarded the East Mark as an essential part of Germanic heritage, the frontier region that safeguarded Germanic lands from eastern invaders historically. By emphasizing the need to integrate German Austria into the Reich, Hitler aimed to rectify what he saw as a historical aberration, reuniting Germanic peoples under one flag. The concept of Weltanschauung, or worldview, is crucial in understanding the national socialist ideology. This worldview went beyond mere political policy. It was an all-encompassing philosophy that sought to redefine every aspect of German life, from art and culture to economy and politics. At the heart of this Weltanschauung was the idea of racial purity and superiority, with the Aryan race deemed the pinnacle of human evolution. By integrating all Germanic territories into a single, racially pure Reich, Hitler sought to create an empire that would dominate Europe and, eventually, the world. National socialism, as a Weltanschauung, positioned itself against perceived threats to this racial purity, whether they were political ideologies, such as communism or certain ethnic groups. This worldview laid the ideological groundwork for many of the atrocities committed in the name of the Third Reich, emphasizing the importance of understanding the weight and implications of the Reich in Hitler's grand vision. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, more commonly known as the Nazi Party, maintained a complex and often duplicitous relationship with the concept of democracy. At the surface, they employed democratic terminology and processes, but these tools were co-opted, manipulated, and ultimately subverted to further their far-reaching objectives, which were fundamentally undemocratic in nature. From the party's early days, Democratic propaganda was leveraged as a means to an end. 
public rallies, impassioned speeches, and extensive election campaigns were all tactics to gain popular support. The Nazis recognized the power of democratic legitimacy in the eyes of the German populace and the international community. Participating in the Weimar Republic's democratic processes allowed them to cloak their radical agenda in a veneer of legitimacy, even though their commitment to the principles of democracy was merely superficial. They understood the sentiment of the masses and knew how to harness the democratic system to their advantage, even if it was with the intention of ultimately dismantling it. However, beneath this facade, the party's objectives were unmistakably clear. Their ultimate vision was not a pluralistic, democratic state where power is distributed and checked by a series of institutions and where rights are universally recognized. Instead, they aimed for a German ethnic state, one that was homogenous in its racial makeup, led by the singular, unchallenged leadership of the National Socialist Party. This state would prioritize the perceived interests of the German people above all else, even at the expense of minorities and perceived enemies within and outside its borders. The idea was to replace the Weimar democracy, which the Nazis viewed as weak, fragmented, and incapable of restoring Germany's national pride and strength, with a totalitarian regime. Under this regime, the state's power would be absolute, with no room for dissent or opposition. All facets of German life, be it political, social, or cultural, would come under the sway of national socialist ideology. It was a vision of autocratic rule, racial purity, and national dominance, masked by the early use of democratic means to achieve undemocratic ends. Mein Kampf stands as one of the most controversial texts in modern history. A book that once echoed the sentiments of a defeated nation would later become the ideological bedrock for a regime responsible for immense suffering and the deaths of millions. This work, penned in the solitude of a prison cell, would reverberate through the annals of history, its impacts felt long after its author's demise. To engage with Mein Kampf is to delve into the mindset of one of the 20th century's most infamous figures. However, it is imperative that this engagement be informed, critical, and contextual. Understanding the geopolitical and historical backdrop against which Hitler wrote is essential in grasping the motivations, fears, and aspirations that permeate its pages. Yet, it's equally important to recognize where the text veers into propaganda, distortion, and outright falsehood. History has shown the catastrophic outcomes that can arise when extremist ideologies go unchallenged. Mein Kampf serves as a testament to this, a grim reminder of the paths societies can tread when seduced by visions of supremacy and grandeur. Yet, it also serves as a cautionary tale, highlighting the importance of vigilance, education, and the critical interrogation of extremist views. In reflecting on Mein Kampf and its legacy, one is reminded of the old adage that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. As divisive ideologies continue to find footholds in various corners of our contemporary world, the lessons of Mein Kampf and the era it epitomized remain as relevant as ever. For in understanding the roots and manifestations of such extremist views, society stands a better chance of confronting, challenging, and ultimately preventing their resurgence.